It's like it came from Ikeda. Is that the word? <laughs> Ikea. I say Ikea, Ikeda. That's where you get your hair cut in Lahui. Hey, so um, I was mentioning to some people tonight, you know, I had so much fun teaching Melchizedek. Hey, Tom. So much fun teaching Melchizedek last week. I was almost kind of bummed it was over. But I remembered um, as I started to prepare yesterday that, man, we're getting so into the, 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 the juicy part of Hebrews. It's so much fun. I had so much fun preparing tonight's lesson. So I, th I think it'd be exciting. And for some reason, I wrote this down yesterday. And now I'm like, it's been, you know, 36 hours. I'm like, why did I think of this? But I was thinking of Santa... Okay, so um, we had this theory, you know, we weren't sure what to do with my kids and Santa because, you know, some people are like, well, why would you teach your kids about an, a fictional character? He's not even real. And then your, your kids won't trust you. They'll think you lied to them. And I was like, well, that's no fun because I don't know about you guys, but I loved the idea of Santa when I was a kid. That was like one of my favorite things about being a kid. And then Holly Potter taught me, she goes, no, no, no. You teach your kids all about Santa, but then you teach them what the truth is. Santa is this guy who's just super excited about Jesus. And that's why he brings gifts. Now, it's a little bit of a flub, but it, the truth of the matter, St. Nicholas, hello, in Turkey, quite literally was a guy who came to Christ late in life. And he was so excited about Jesus, he went around quite literally and put money in people's stockings that they'd hung out to dry and it became became a real thing so I don't know if you all knew that but it actually but so here's the great thing about the mythology of Santa it's this sort of in, invisible guy who brings physical gifts which is kind of I think a great way to sort of teach our kids pointing the way to an invisible God in heaven right who sends his physical son the absolute image of the father who comes um, and he gives them as a gift. And it opens this whole concept, what I wrote in my notes, this treasury of Old Testament physical things that find their fruition and their completion in Christ. If that didn't make any sense, bear with me, it will. Think about this, Christ as the great prophet. Moses was just a picture of a prophet, of who Christ would really be, right? Or the high priest last week, Melchizedek, was just a picture of the real great high priest who was to come. The reason I bring all this up, because there was another one in today's Daily Bread, Garrett. Today's Daily Bread was a quotation out of Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Let me read it to you. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity... Who's that? <laughs> Abba Father, right? All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And I love this. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was cut off when you were circumcised by Christ. Wow, what a concept, yeah? In other words, circumcision was yet again another physical reality in the Old Testament that finds its spiritual completion and fulfillment in Christ in the New Testament in a spiritual sense. I mean, how many more of these do we have to go? Well, tonight we won't be talking about circumcision, but we will be talking about the tabernacle, yet again, another physical reality that finds its spiritual fulfillment and deeper reality in Christ. Okay, so did you see how that all got put together? Santa, circumcision, tabernacle. No, if not, see me after class. Okay, so very, very, very brief review. This is maybe the shortest review ever. The Jews under Nero are undergoing persecution back in ancient Rome. Are you with me? And they are being tempted to go back, and I quite put that in quotations, go back to the safety of the synagogue and even temple worship. And the author of Hebrews is like, no, no, no. There's no going back because all of that, the Old Testament, was all leading to this, the new covenant, the New Testament. 
Jesus. There is no going back. All that was just pointing away to this. And therefore, that's why we get the serious warnings. Do not try to go back, okay? So last week, praise God, we did the fun study of Melchizedek. In a nutshell, the very abbreviated version, um, I started with that quote, Melchizedek commands a disproportionate amount of importance in the redemptive history compared to the amount of space devoted to him in scripture, right? Because he's only in four verses in the entire Old Testament, four verses, and yet he is the key, the hinge to justifying how Jesus Christ can be both king and high priest. So remember, he shows up in Genesis for three verses, this dude who's called the king of righteousness, He's got bread and wine. Sound familiar like anybody you might know? <laughs> Abraham tithes up to him, right? You know? And then he disappears for a thousand years. He shows up again in a song written by David. It happens to be a messianic song all about the king, the Messiah who's to come. And, and David drops this one line. Oh yeah, by the way, you will be a priest in the line of Melchizedek. Bing, there he gets, appears. Another thousand years of silence. Christ comes, but there's a problem which Tom Clements pointed out <laughs> prematurely four weeks ago. <laughs> Donna, you weren't here. I still haven't forgiven him for it. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, um, but he comes, but Jesus is from what tribe? Levi. No, Jesus oh. is from Jesus. Judah, right? The, the tribe of kings. Uh-oh, because... Only a, he has to also be the high priest over his own sacrifice because no worldly, earthly priest, as we're going to find out, as we found out actually last week and we'll find out again tonight, could ever oversee the sacrifice. Why? Because those, those guys, remember that's what he said, those guys were sinful. So Jesus has to be the high priest, but he's from the wrong tribe. Uh-oh, because he's not from the tribe of Levite. But of course, that's when we find out where the beauty of Melchizedek comes in because he predates the Mosaic law. He predates even the tribe of Levite. In fact, it even says he was still in the body, right? Uh, the priesthood was still in the body of Aaron, as it were, right? And he predates. And so Jesus gets his priestly authority from before the tribe of Levi even was, which makes him a greater even high priest, okay? And then we finished out, um, oh wait, by the way, I couldn't miss this part. His office is validated by an oath from God the Father, right? Which plays out as his priesthood is, and I wrote this down, remember? These are the words used to describe it. It's better, it's permanent, it's complete, one time for all, and forever, yeah? Five keys to the supremacy of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Now, we closed last week with a brief speculation on Melchizedek. Was he uh, a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament? Was he an angel? Or was he just a dude with a, with a role to play? We all agreed and came to the conclusion that Melchizedek is clearly the half of habit. Okay, so um, I'm just joking. Obviously, we didn't really quite. Yeah, he was clearly a Okay, yeah, so we didn't really come to a full agreement. I don't really know that we all could ever really know. But so tonight, I'm excited because we are going to continue this exploration of how these, for lack of a better word, elements of the Old Testament, physical realities, elements of the Old Testament, find their completion and their fulfillment in Christ. And this is a theory that we need to pay attention to. Oh, oh no, I want to tell you about a new theory that we have to pay attention to, because I was waiting till we got to this point. And that is, the book of Hebrews uses these words, copies, shadows, symbols, images, and illustrations, okay, to talk about Old Testament things. So, you know, like when Rick does an object lesson, like, remember the monkey wrench, right? <laughs> fun, 
<laughs> Every week we do a story or an illustration or an object lesson, right? And we're always like, you know, it's not about the object lesson. Like, remember I used the broom one time? It's not really about the broom. The object lesson is always to point back to the reality of Christ and the theory that we're learning, right? Well, interestingly enough, the book of Hebrews uses the entire Old Testament as if it were an object lesson because it says those things. So my point is this. What I want you to do tonight and every night henceforth because Tonight's the first night they really come up strong, and we'll be seeing them in the chapters to come. Whenever we come across a word like this, I think I'm going to ask you to underline it, if you're an underliner, in your Bible, because it, because it reveals to us what's going on. So tonight we're going to see that even the tabernacle was an absolute an object lesson that God inserted for our instruction. Okay? Are you with me on that? It should be fun. So join me in chapter 8. Let's just do the first two verses. The point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Now, I underlined the word true right there because if that is the true tabernacle, what does that say about the other tabernacle? Well, I wouldn't use the word false because it's not a false tabernacle. But if you were like me, you kind of thought that for a second. You're like, well, could it have been a false tabernacle? No, but we'll get there to a second. Okay. But very briefly, for those of you that didn't sit through the book of Exodus or Leviticus with us, the tabernacle, um, after God rescues the Israelites from Egypt, the question is, how can a holy, holy, holy God, remember Mount Sinai, that's why I'm doing this. How could that holy, holy, holy God be with his people that are sinful? And the answer is at the tabernacle, they would sacrifice, well, all kinds of things, actually. Goats, lambs, bulls, all kind, pigeons, <laughs> wine, coffee, if they had it. Um, no, <laughs> what's that? Flour. Flour. Yeah, yeah, flour. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> As sacrifices to cleanse them of their sins at the Day of Atonement was the big day, really, that did it, Right. And God gives them very exact instructions of how they're going to build this. Now, by the way, when I say tabernacle, just so you know, I'm talking about a tent. It's a mobile tabernacle. I joke about it, but it's kind of worth, you know, it's a comparison worth giving. It's like it came from Ikeda. Is that the word? <laughs> Ikea. I say Ikea, Ikeda. That's where you get your hair cut in Lahui. <laughs> Ikeda is where you get your hair cut. Ikea is where you order furniture from Sweden or something, right? Norway? Anybody? Sweden, right? Yeah? And it comes in a box. You ever get one of those boxes and you're like, no way is this a couch, right? <laughs> but lo and behold, well, the tabernacle was quite literally a tent. It was a mobile temple. But remember, God was very specific. You were supposed to build it specifically like this. Tonight, we're going to find out why? It's pretty cool. Yeah? Okay, exact instructions. And then that's where the sacrifices would happen. And the priest um, would do their sacrifices. Everybody remember the story because I've taught it a million times in here. There was no chairs in the tabernacle. You weren't allowed to sit in the presence of God. And the idea was as well that there was so much sacrifice that had to be going. They could never take a break. Those sacrifices had to keep going as we're going to find out why um, tonight. But the true tabernacle is not set up by man. Okay, uh, we're to, okay, we're going to get this. Let's read verses 3 and 5. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also. This one is talking about Jesus, the high priest. Um, for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there were already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow, underline those, of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Let's just stop here for a second. Um, that's why I sent those dumb memes yesterday on my um, email about shadows and copies. And my meme about the copier, it said, um, 
something about the guy that makes that leaves colored copier paper in the copier. You know why that's a big deal to me? Because my office is upstairs. So I hit print and then run downstairs and grab my, there's colored paper in the copy. So then I have to go switch out the paper and go dun, 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 dun. And one time I did that and Kelly came out and put colored paper back in while I hit print. And I dun, 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 came back, what the? It's Kelly. Anyways, but this is why. So think about, this is interesting. We've talked about there is a true tabernacle in heaven. And then down here on earth, these earthly priests serve at a sanctuary that were a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. And so what we're finding out is that this earthly tabernacle is just an object lesson, an illustration. Now, this is interesting. Note this, that the tabernacle is not a false tabernacle because false is the opposite of true. A much better way to look at it is it was temporary and inadequate, okay? Um, it is, you know, by the way, a shadow, think about it, is a, represent uh, is a true representation of who you are, right? But it's a distorted representation of who you are, and there's no um, oomph to it. There's no physical, there's no weight to a shadow, right? So the original tabernacle is sort of a distorted, temporary, and not altogether adequate representation of the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. Um, or as um, John MacArthur said, thus, th because of this, Jesus never really goes near the Holy of Holies. And he's not even qualified to serve in the shadow temple. If you think about it, he wasn't a Levite, right? Yeah? His temple that he serves in is the true temple. And by the way, I have my own little scriptural um, explanation behind that. In the book of Mark, um, the first time Jesus ever shows up at the temple. Now, I know in the book of Luke, he's there as a kid, and maybe they reckon he was there at other times, but bear with me on this. In the book of Mark, Jesus finally gets to Jerusalem, right? And he shows up at the temple for the first time. And the way I always like to describe it is, should not this have been a really big deal? Like, like do the math on that. Think about this. What is supposed to be there in the temple? The presence of God. The Holy of Holies, right? Behind the thick curtain and between the two cherubim. The holy presence of God. Now, who has entered the temple? God's son. Right? This should be like, bum, 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 bum. Like, like you know, the nitro hit should hit the glycerin. And I don't know. Some. And what does Jesus say? You know what he says in the book of Mark? Yeah, it's late. Let's go back to Lazarus's, get some dinner. And he leaves. <laughs> what the heck? Like, to me, it's like, it's like the biggest anticlimactic moment maybe in the history of mankind, right? Why? Well, because he serves at the true tabernacle. And in the light of Jesus, that holy of holies there, the, the, Sol the uh, Herod's temple, it's just a shadow it's just a shadow in the light of the reality of Christ. And Jesus goes, yeah, I'm hungry. Let's go eat. Isn't that wild? Yeah. It wasn't time. Yet. It wasn't time. Well, actually, what had happened was I would, I would go, I'm going to go just the opposite, Peg. The time had come. And what we're going to find out tonight, the temple's done. It's done. In fact, if anything, uh, depending on your chronological it was actually the Saturday before the Passover. So quite literally in six days, right? There's no need for that temple at all, ever, ever, ever again. It becomes an empty shell from that time on. And by the way, um, and I'm, I'm belaboring this point, so let me, let me keep moving here. Um, but look what it says too. This is uh, at the end of verse five. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern because he was going to have him build it according to the pattern of the true temple um, 
in heaven. So the tabernacle um, is not false, but inadequate. Now we're going to find out is, so was the old covenant. And boy, it's hard for me to even speak those words out loud because I don't want to, what's the word I'm looking for, denigrate the old covenant. Because it, was the, it, was, it served its purpose, didn't it? You know, so it's not a false covenant, right? But it was inadequate. We're going to find out why right now. Let's read verses 6 through the first part of 8. Maybe that's why the temple was never rebuilt. Oh, I'm sure of it. And we're not there yet. We'll, we will get there. We're going to come back and talk later on about the state of the temple and all that. But I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Okay, verse 6. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs. Whose? the Old Testament priest, right? As the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, and it is founded on better promises. For there, if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. Wait, look what he said right there. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, now that begs the question, wait, was there something wrong with the first covenant? Well, it's a little bit of semantics, but I'm going to submit to you tonight. I don't think there was anything wrong with that covenant, but we're going to find out in the next verse what was actually wrong. Ready? Verse 8. But God found fault with the people. <laughs> the only fault of the first covenant was mankind couldn't uphold their part of the covenant. The fault of the first covenant was it was reliant on mankind to keep it. And they could not. God found fault with the people. Now, by the way, just a little deviation here. I just want to point out that the Bible, if you think about it, and not many people talk about it, the Bible is not very complimentary toward humans. <laughs> it's really not. But I want to add to that, neither is history. Really. I mean, in the Old Testament, every step of the way, the Israelites screwed it up. Over and over. And the history of Israel is just the history of, hey, they're doing a good thump. Hey, that was really bad. Repent. Everything goes wrong. Repent. Return to God. They return to God. Hey, they're doing really good. God blesses them. Thump. They blow it again. Over and over and over. I was just telling, um, I was talking to Matt Drake today about, that was one of the more illustrated things. One of the more amazing things I think I discovered by going through the book, book of Leviticus that I never knew before and that was you know when we got to the end part and it was all about the sabbath years every seven years give the land rest and every 50 years or 49 years which started today by the way. yeah it started today right yeah it started today every 49 years there was the jubilee year and everybody went back da, 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 and it was all wonderful what a great way to run a society it was beautiful and perfect one small problem they never did it or at least we have zero evidence. I mean, one thing we know for a fact is by the time it got to King uh, Josiah, we found this book. <laughs> they hadn't done a Passover in so long, nobody knew what the Passover was. Well, for crying out loud, you get my point? Now, history, secular history, isn't any better. I mean, I remember sitting around like, you know, in college doing what we called, my dad called bowl sessions, how to solve all the world's problems. And no matter what, we could never think of a way out of mankind's problems because as soon as you thought, well, what if we did this and what if we did that? You're like, yeah, but then somebody would ruin it. You know, somebody, somebody would take advantage of it, right? If there, there, the reason I said this too, by the way, is, um, well, I thought of another, no, I just, let me skip that. Um, but I want to get on to this other illustration. I read about this guy, Mark Lore. Anybody heard of this guy? A recent article on this billionaire by the name of Mark Lore, who is going to build, he looks like he's going to do it, a utopian city called Tolosa. Now, before I just kind of undercut it a little bit, <laughs> let me just say this. I, I think the guy's got some really good ideas. I'm excited for him to do it. He wants to design a city. It's going to cost $4 billion. He's already got investors. They're looking for land. They're probably going to do it. And it's pretty genius. They want to build kind of the ultimate city based on like Tokyo, Stockholm, and New York. Combine the best things. It'll be a place where like um, you can get to the anywhere you need in the city within 15 minutes. 
uh, underground will be all the deliveries and all the, you know, um, utilities. It's sustainable. It's all this beautiful stuff. I mean, really looks good. And then he said this, and this will be the most open, most fair, and most inclusive city in the world. You know, <laughs> I thought to myself, oh boy, he's, he doesn't really know any real people, does he? And this is what I thought, hearing him say that, I thought, here's a guy who's a billionaire, and he's most likely surrounded by people that go, yes, sir, yes, Mark, yes, uh-huh, whatever you do. And he's amazed at how efficient everything around him runs. The cost of that. <laughs> what happens when you get your first you know, round of homeless people that are super excited to go live in this super clean city? But they don't want to clean up after themselves, or they don't want to work. Or what I, By the way, I don't mean to pick on the homeless people. But look, we know that, that the problem isn't infrastructure, is it? It's what? It's people. It's humans. We, we're the ones that mess everything up. God found fault with the people. And eventually, Mark Lore will as well. He just will. You can't build a utopia on this planet. It's been attempted time and time and time again. And you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Even God, even God could not create an earthly utopia with humans. He tried it with the Israelites and it failed because human nature. Okay? That's what. What's that? Adam and Eve weren't good at decision making. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Adam and Eve. I didn't even think about that. If you've never read the history of Biosphere 2, Peg's got a great point. It is, whole, I mean, people could not get along. And it, and it killed the project. But let's talk about the New Covenant. Uh, let's finish 8 through, uh, I think we go all the way to 12. Yeah. Okay, verse 8. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. By the way, I need, maybe I need to tell you this in advance. Um, he's um, uh, he's, he's um, quoting from, uh, I'm sorry, is it Jeremiah? I, I lost my notes. Thank you. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. So this is a prophecy that's, what, seven or 800 years old, 600, 500 years old, somewhere in that, in that zone. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like, oh, I was like, I thought that was you. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, the Mosaic covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Now, by the way, some of you might not know this. If you don't, this is a good thing to know. What's another name for covenant? Testament. That's where I was going to go with that. Testament. So, you know, we talk about the Old Testament, the New Testament. It's two different covenants. Covenant, covenant, right? So the New Covenant, the New Testament, right? Um, again, the fault was with mankind, and the Old Testament was dependent on mankind. But now, laws in their mind and written on their heart is talking about these things. Okay, first of all, the extent. It's going to go out to the Gentiles now. So he uses this word, um, all the people. Um, they will all, I will be their God. They all will be my people. So it's going to go out to the Gentiles. Um, they will now, as um, Emerson pointed out, will have the undwelling Holy Spirit, which is a conscious. That's your heart and your mind, the Holy Spirit. The law is written on our hearts. And then they will be part of the covenant. I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Under the old covenant, they would sacrifice lambs, whatever, but it was never permanent because we're not even there yet. But eventually we will get to the once for all, which occurs again tonight and again in a couple weeks. Uh, let me just um, read you this verse from Ezekiel, uh, and then I'll read verse 13 and we'll just pause for a second. From Ezekiel, again, a prophecy hundreds of years before Christ. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. 
I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. So he's going to give us the deposit of the Holy Spirit, which is why um, Jeremiah can say, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And if you have ever blatantly sinned and you felt guilty in the process of doing it, you know darn well what it means to have an indwelling Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> That is your conscience. It's quite literally the role played by Jiminy Cricket in the, in the book Pinocchio. And we laugh because we all go, yeah, the Holy Spirit's not really Jiminy Cricket. But quite honestly, the author of Pinocchio wrote in Jiminy the Cricket. Jiminy? Jiminy? Jiminy Cricket. Not Jiminy the Cricket, just Jiminy Cricket. Jiminy Cricket quite literally was the role of the Holy Spirit in um, if you've ever watched that movie and looked for, uh, Rick Bunshu does this with um, high schoolers. And so the first time I ever went to a Rick Bunshu high school camp, it was an assignment. He gave each of us a piece of paper and a pen and put on Pinocchio and said, how many biblical references can you pick out? And it's amazing. Yeah, the temptation, the death, the resurrection. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Anyways, okay, sorry, don't want to get on that. Um, thing. But let's read verse 13 and then I'll pause for a second. Verse th 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Wow. Just, can we just pause for a second to consider the audience that is reading this? originally or here I should maybe say hearing it because it was very likely a sermon or it was taught yeah wait wait sorry the old covenant you mean the mosaic law to peg's point this is where I was going to say peg this is where your point is well said here the temple the sacrifice the lambs the goats and are you ready for this the levitical priesthood is now obsolete right what by the way, the word for um, my, my NIV says um, will soon disappear. I think, what does the amplified version say, Lewis? I've been following the NIV. Okay, sorry. Well, just so you know, in the Greek, it actually means destroy. Well, old is ready to disappear. Ready to disappear. Okay, in the Greek. Out of use, annulled. Out of use and annulled. annulled. Yeah. King James says vanished. King James says vanished. How's that? Can we just pause for a second there? Um, like I, I wrote in my notes, like a shadow before light, right? If the, old, if, the, if the temple was like a shadow, what happens when the light comes? It disappears. It vanishes, as it says, yeah? Anyways, um, let's just pause there for a second. I've talked a lot. Does anybody have comments um, or questions to this point? But I, I always like to say... Um, a do-over sounds like more like a mulligan in golf. And a problem with a mulligan in golf is, well, that didn't work. Whereas the way I see it more, and I think Melchizedek is the proof of this, that God had a plan from the get-go. And so he installs the Mosaic Covenant, but he knows full well they're not going to pull this off. Because as we're going to find out, Later on, was it chapter 10, I think? Forgiveness was never acquired through the blood of animals, right? So when God tells them to sacrifice lambs, he knows they're going to blow it. He knows they can't handle the responsibility of it. So it's not like God was up in heaven going, oh, oy vey, right? <laughs> you couldn't do that? He knew it. So it wasn't like he was surprised. It was like, oh man, what am I going to do next? Because he knew, from, he knew from the fall of Adam that he was going to send his son. Yeah? Because even as we're going to find out tonight, the priests were fallen, as we saw last week, because the priests were sinful. The animals were fallen creation and imperfect. And you know what? Even the tabernacle itself, if you think about it, is built of what? Cloth and wood. Where is it all now? It's all rotted away. It's all gone. Yeah. Built by man. Built by man. Imperfectly built by man. Yeah, the law is good. Yeah. Our inability to keep it. Yeah, nothing wrong with the law. 
which actually goes back to, uh, you know, Breyer's point, yeah? There's nothing, the law was good. It was mankind that couldn't uphold it. In fact, the law drives us to grace, yeah? It's both a threat, but it's also holiness. It really is, yeah? It's good stuff. So let's do the first seven verses of chapter 9. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly, I underline that, an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up in its first room where the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold... I've got the golden altar of incense. Wait, did I say? The ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail. Now, when everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly in the outer room to carry out their ministry, or carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. Now, I'm just going to stop right there and say this. We cannot discuss all this in detail. <laughs> I love that he said that. Because for crying out loud, we just did the entire book of Leviticus, right? So I don't need to explain all of that to you. You should all know that already. If you don't, go back and watch on PastorDane.com um, all, the, all the parts of Leviticus. Um, however, briefly, I love how you see Christ in all those elements, like the lampstand, the light of the world is Christ, or the showbread, Christ is the bread that came down from heaven, and the manna, and, and, and all of that. It's all symbolic of Christ. Now, um, why does it said, you know, why did I underline never without blood? What would happen if anybody entered that curtain behind, you know, the Holy of Holies without being covered in blood? <laughs> I would direct you to Uzzah, <laughs> who was a smoking clump of, yeah, yeah, whatever, right. When he, he just reached out and touched the Ark of the Covenant, it wasn't even behind the curtain with the Holy of Holy, and I don't even think the presence of God was dwelling there. All he did was touch it, and poof, he got zapped, yeah. Imagine. trying to keep it from going off the road. Yeah, his intention was good. Which is, by the way, we always look at that as some kind of judgment. But I always think he like reached out to touch it and poof, all of a sudden, oh, hey, God. <laughs> he was in the presence of God. But I don't want to talk about Uzzah. Let's keep going. Um, verses 8 to 10. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration oh underline that an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper they were only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings external regulations applying until the time of the new order how is all that i i, I hope you guys are excited about all of that these are just physical things that were pictures of the deeper reality to come. So, um, more importantly, the Holy Spirit is showing, and I love that it says, it says the Holy Spirit was teaching us this, right? Verse 8, the Holy Spirit was simply showing that the whole deal with the temple, the sacrifices, the priesthood, the instruments, all of that, it was all an illustration for the present time. By the way, the, word, the Greek word for illustration, parabole or parable. Isn't that interesting? What's a parable but a story that Jesus tells that points to the reality of Christ? The whole tabernacle, the whole bit with the priests and the sacrificial offerings, it was just a parable until the time of the new order, which sometimes, by the way, is translated as the time of the Reformation. I thought that was pretty cool, which means to make straight. Because which part of that old story was crooked? Well, all of it. Man, <laughs> the physical elements that were prone to decay, right? All of it. The blood of fallen animals that would never really, could never really 
bring forgiveness, yeah? What I wrote down here, man's part, imperfect men using items that tarnish, that moths can eat and men can steal. And all of that exactly happened. Because where are all those instruments now? Well, I know some people think they're hidden underneath, you know, or they're in the Smithsonian if you watched. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the Brit yeah, the British Museum or, or Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's in a box somewhere in the Smithsonian, right? Bear with me on that. Well, technically, stolen. <laughs> so it would still work, right? Okay, verse 11. Or Rome. Yeah, or Rome, yeah. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, i got to come back to that in a second, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not part of this creation. God, are you guys with me on this? Is this amazing or what? He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all, there's that issue again, once for all, by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonial, ceremonial unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, because those other things were always blemished, to cleanse our consciences from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Oh my, is there so much in there, right? He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that's not man-made, and I love this, not a part of this creation. And by the way, when he says the good things that are already here, what he's talking about, by the way, some translations say things to come, but either way works because who he's talking to, remember, are Jews that are being tempted to going back to the Old Testament. And he says, no, 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 no. Christ came as the high priest of the good things that are here now, right? Don't go back because it's all being made here. Now, uh, here's a quote I read today. The new sanctuary is not made by men or on earth or of even earthly materials. And he says this, it is made by God in heaven and of heavenly materials. The new sanctuary is in fact heaven, which by the way, doesn't negate the other point that we are the new temple, but he's talking now specifically about this sort of holy of holies that is a picture of heaven itself. And so then we have this idea that the Old Testament was external physical cleansing, yeah, for an external physical cleanliness. But now we have been clean, cleansed once and for all, our inner man, our inner consciousness. And, and how much better is this? Because it asks the question, how much more then will the blood of Christ? Well, let me count the ways. The new way isn't physical, but spiritual. And according to these words that we've read tonight, it's better. It's, it's a, a deeper reality. It is a once for all. It is permanent. It is complete. And it is forever. And the outflow of all of this is that we, look what he says at the last line, verse 14, so that we may serve the living God. What's he talking about? Well, the old way, the priests, yeah, only they went into the Holy of Holies. The high priests only went once a year into the Holy of Holies. But you understand what Christ has done now by ripping that curtain apart, he brings us in. Stick with me on this, yeah? He brings us into his presence, right? Because it's all about the presence as we're going to see in the next few verses, right? Where now we serve, which is why, who said, was it Peter, wrote that we are a what? A royal priesthood. No more Levitical priesthood. Instead, what we have is the priesthood of all believers, which I just had a quick revelation, I guess would put us in the line of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Yeah. Don't think too 
I don't want to think too hard about that. Take that with a huge grain of salt. But I think we might be onto something there, right? That's off the top of my head. But by the way, think what a mind blower this would be for the Jews listening to this. I mean, they must have been blowing their minds, right? Let's keep going, because we really, I think we can cover all this. Well, maybe not. We're getting pretty close. Okay, let's keep going. We'll stop when we run out of time. Verses, um, thank you, 15 to 22. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Look how he's addressing his audience there. In the case of a will, I love this, in a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. That is why, this is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet, wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll on all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood of both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, it's like a will. By the way, I don't think anything in there was like too confusing. But first of all, where there's a will, there's wealth to be had. No, just kidding. I was, a, I was an old W.C. Fields thing. Where there's a will, prosperity is right around the corner or something like that. Anyways, but it doesn't take effect until someone dies. Okay, so um, there had to be a death of animals under the first covenant. Oh, by the way, I thought of this today. This is a really interesting point. Isn't this fascinating? All, not all, but many, if not all, the cultures around them at that time practiced human sacrifice. Isn't it fascinating that the Israelites, oh man, they could never, they never practiced human sacrifice. That would be a blasphemy, murder. All through the Bible, we are never to take the life of another human being, right? Now, warfare is a different story. I don't want to get into the Just Cause War program or whatever, but this and that. But because we are made in the image of God, it was never unto a man to take the life of another. And only Christ, only Christ could be sacrificed um, on our behalf, yeah? Um, By the way, it's a really important point as well. There would be no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. This is a really important point that God never looks at us and goes, well, you poor humans, you know, I, I, you meant well, but yeah, I'm just going to let your sins slide. No way. No way. All our sins, all our sins, from the least of our sins to the greatest of our sins, and every human being that's ever lived outside of Christ mm-hmm. had to be forgiven by the blood of Christ. It had to be a sacrifice. He dies a real death for us at great cost. And it's like the author of Hebrews wants to remind us and the Jews not to just kind of skip by this, but there will be no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Okay, let's keep going because I think we can finish here. Verse 23 to 24, it was necessary then for the copies, there we go, <laughs> of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, talking about the Old Testament, or the Old tabernacle, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's Mm. presence. Woof! By the way, um, copies, um, the Greek word means sketches or outlines. I thought that was pretty good. The earthly tabernacle was just like a sketch or, you know, an outline of, yeah. So if, um, okay, do the math on this. What is the tabernacle copy of? Heaven itself. So I, I love this because the key idea is this. If we think of heaven as a physical geographic idea, it's pretty cool because, you know, it teaches us in the Bible that heaven, you know, the new Jerusalem will come down. It is an actual physical place, you know, with the jewels and the streets of gold and all that, right? That's pretty cool. 
But I love this idea that I think occurs in these verses right here. The most important thing of all is really what the Holy of Holies represents. And what it really represents is considered right there in verse 24. He entered heaven itself to appear for us in the presence of God. Because the great thing about heaven is not that it has streets of gold, but it is that for eternity we are in the presence of God. Because that was the whole idea be, be, behind God being with the Israelites in the desert. I will, they will be, I, they, I will be their God and they will be my people. I will dwell. It li quite literally says in the scripture, I will tabernacle with them. It quite honestly means I will dwell in a tent. I will go camping with them, right? We will camp with God for all eternity. And that is the beauty of heaven. Not that it's streets of gold, which is nice too. Not that there's a river of life, which is great. <laughs> not that we're going to get new bodies and God knows I could use one right now. Yeah, it's all great. But all that is totally secondary to the best part of all. And that is we will dwell in the presence of God. Okay, verse 25. Almost done. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. We've covered this point ad nauseum already, so I'm just going to go quickly through it. The way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own, then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he's appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with the sin by the sacrifice of himself. I'm going to stop right there because we've covered this point once for all over and over. But a new point came up in my study today that I think is pretty important. Um, and this was an issue with the early reformers regarding the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, which is an idea that during the communion service or the um, Eucharist, because of the priest overseeing it, it becomes the actual blood and the actual body of Christ. And Martin Luther had a real problem with that. And effectively, what that Catholic doctrine was doing was seeking to sacrifice Christ over and over. Now, if you thought that was just sort of a Protestant argument and some hyperbole to hack on the Catholics, not true. Because it was actually a doctrine by a Catholic theologian, Ludwig Ott, that was ratified by the Council of Trent in 1545 as a counter to Luther, a counter-reformation, a counter to Luther's teaching, right? That, in effect, the Catholic doctrine was, yes, we are actually sacrificing Christ again, okay? That's why the, Re the Reformed Church, or even at Kauai Christian Fellowship, <laughs> we do communion to remember Christ's death once for all, but we don't sacrifice him again. And then the last verse for tonight, verses 27, actually two verses tonight, 27. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And I thought this is a really cool thought that we can end on tonight. Like all men, Jesus Christ was divinely appointed to die once. But unlike all other men, he will never face judgment because he took our sins upon himself. He took our judgment upon himself. But the judgment was for our sins, not for his, because he had none. Isn't that interesting? He takes our judgment, yet he himself is not judged because he had no sin, which is why he can be resurrected. So I thought this was interesting. People eagerly awa were awa awaiting his second coming. On the day of atonement in the old tabernacle, when the high priest went in the, the Holy of Holies, people sort of almost held their breath, right? Yeah. The anticipation, would it work? He had to do very specific things and he couldn't screw it up, right? What if he died in there? Would God accept the sacrifice on the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement? And so there was always great anticipation that the priest would come out. Likewise for us. 
when Jesus comes back at the second coming of Christ, when he comes back, our salvation is already guaranteed, right? He won't be back to forgive our sins. They're forgiven already. That's all done. What he comes back is just to bring the completion and the fulfillment, yeah? But we eagerly anticipate his coming back as well. And so all the way back to Tom's earlier point on this and what Peg mentioned earlier as well, 70 years after Christ, the temple is destroyed. The only place where sacrifices could be made. And since then, there has never been an official sacrifice there has been no need for a Jewish priesthood. They don't even call themselves priests anymore. They are rabbis, which means teacher, right? A rabbi is a teacher. Um, Yom Kippur is still celebrated as the holiest day in Jewish calendar, but there's no priests and there's no sacrifices because there is no temple. In the absence of a temple, Jews are now obligated to study the high priest's ritual on Yom Kippur, and this study helps them achieve atonement, this is what they believe, for those who are unable to benefit from its actual performance. But it's only a shadow. Now do you understand why the author of Hebrews was writing this to his fellow Jewish brethren? There's no going back to the temple. Isn't that cool? Okay. In fact, all I'm going to say, because I'm out of time, all I want to say one last time is, do you now see why the author of the Hebrews was writing to his Jewish brethren to say, don't go back. Don't go to the synagogue. Don't go to the temple. It's done. Isn't that awesome? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for tonight's teaching, God. That was a whole big chunk, Lord, but oh, what great, great stuff. Thank you that you are our high priest. Think that you've created a way for us to be in the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, as it were. And thank you that it was one time, one shot for all, and that it's permanent and that it's eternal. All of that, Lord, we have to look to you for our salvation. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Sorry, I kind of felt like I had to squeeze all that in there, but I just really felt like it all went together in one package. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Isn't Hebrews awesome? It's so good.